Hello, everyone. This is Lauren Steiner. Welcome to tonight's edition of The Robust Opposition. I'm really pleased to be having on my friend Medea Benjamin for the second time on my show. But I had to have her on because of the incredible disruption that she just did at the Hudson Institute last week. But before I bring her on, I wanted to show you, I put up a, a special um, picture that I recently bought at the Shepherd Fairy Show of a guy holding a peace sign being surrounded by cops because Medea is the uh, co-founder of uh, Code Pink Women for Peace. How are you tonight, Medea? Wonderful. Nice to be on your show, Lauren. Thank you. Um, so let's get right into the disruption and then we're going to we're going to talk about Iran because you just wrote a book on Iran and I actually live streamed your book talk when you were out here in Los Angeles recently. It is time for all nations to join us in holding Iran to a new level of accountability for its destructive behavior, especially its lawless pursuit of ballistic missiles. Thank you. That is the most ridiculous thing I have seen. The world community wants to keep the Iran nuclear deal. Our allies are the, the Germans, the French, the British. They want to keep in this deal. The world community wants to keep the deal. Let's talk about normal countries. Let's talk about Saudi Arabia. Is that who our allies are? They are the biggest threat to the world community. And let's talk. You're hurting me. You're actually hurting me. I want to. I want to ask, do you think these sanctions are hurting the regime or are they hurting the Iranian people? They're hurting the Iranian people. You are making a case for a war with Iran. How did the war with Iraq turn out? You're doing exactly the same thing we did in the case of Iraq. We don't want another war in the Middle East. Ma'am, ma you want to go outside and give How does speech? Iraq turn you out? Do How did you Libya turn out? You do we that. have the people can, of Syria suffering. Time. And how dare you bring up the issue of Yemen? It's the Saudi bombing that is killing most people in Yemen. So let's get real. No more. You've planned a lot of disruptions over the years, but this one was not planned. Tell us how this went down. Well, it's really funny because we didn't hear about this talk until the night before. And I thought, oh, we should just get a couple of uh, quick, make some posters and go and stand outside while the people are going in and be a, you know, voice for peace outside. And so I didn't even dress to go inside. I had my T-shirt on that said peace with Iran. And I had seen the night before that registration was closed, that it said, bring your ID to get in. Um, so that's why I had planned to just be outside. But I figured, what the heck, let me just try to walk in and see what happens. And so I skirted around the person in the lobby who was checking people in, got upstairs, skirted around the table where they were checking people in there. And I put myself right in the front row, assuming somebody would come and say, uh, Medea, good try, but um, we're going to escort you out. And I would have um, made a little bit of a scene there saying, "What's? Uh, or don't you believe in free speech and um, blah, blah, blah. But uh, instead, they just let me sit there. And uh, so I sat there and um, waited until the speech was over, but I had no plan whatsoever to be inside or to do any disruption. Now, you mentioned on uh, Aaron Maté's The Real News that uh, their question and answer session was very scripted. They were passing out cards and you knew that they weren't going to ask you, they weren't going to say the question that you would write down. So um, it was really great because we were able to hear it because it sounded like you were mic'd. But that was C-SPAN's mic, right? Yes. So they followed you around, they showed the whole thing, and then you mentioned they even sent you a clip of it afterwards. Well, they posted online a clip of it afterwards with my name on it. And that was uh, really what it took to get this out uh, across the country and in, particularly in Iran. All right, we're going to talk about the nature of this disruption and what they were talking about. But first, I want to go back in time a little bit and talk about all your other disruptions. List for us 
uh, because Aaron Mate had that great clip of you basically walking down the stairs with Donald Rumsfeld and pointing to him and saying, war criminal, he's a war criminal, right to his face. <laughs> and that was the correspondence that. dinner, yeah. Of course, yeah, because you were all dressed up. Did they, did they haul you out of there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you sacrifice getting to go to a lot of these fun things and you get hauled out of a lot of places. Tell us about some of the places, the, the people you've disrupted and the places you were hauled out of. Well, I've disrupted a lot of things in the National Press Club, including Hillary Clinton. In fact, I've been banned for life many times at the press club. I keep going back and getting banned for life again. So I'm like a cat that has many lives. Um, I've disrupted... Uh, Barack Obama, when he was giving his major talk at the National Defense University, Code Pink, not myself, but us as a team, disrupted every night of the Democratic and Republican conventions um, during, since the time we really started. We interrupted Donald Trump during his inaugural address uh, this time. And uh, I've certainly interrupted George Bush many times. Um, uh, secretaries of state, uh, let's see, oh, and then Congress on a regular basis. So we try to go where the people in power are. Uh, sometimes we go to directly their homes, like I did with um, John Brennan, the head of the CIA, or John Kerry when he was Secretary of State, uh, or we went to the um, Jay Johnson's home, the head of uh, Homeland Security, and actually had about a half hour talk with him until he invited us to come to his office. So I moved to Washington DC from California to be closer to these folks and we get as close as we can. Now, do you get nervous? Because I used to, I do public speaking now, but when I started doing public speaking, I mean, my heart would pound and I would get so nervous, my palms would sweat. Do you get nervous or is this just like old hat for you? Well, I get nervous if I'm going to do a disruption um, in a very hostile kind of place where I think people might beat me up because oftentimes it's not the security guards who are well trained, uh, hopefully, but it's the people around you. And we have been hurt on many occasions by very nasty people around us who don't believe in free speech. Uh, so. Um, that is something that makes me nervous. And and in, in general, I mean, it's not an easy thing to get up, jump on top of a stage and confront somebody. So I certainly do get nervous. I get nervous that I might forget what it is I want to say. Uh, I get nervous that I could get um, hurt. And I uh, have a very bad shoulder. It's been uh, dislocated many times. And so I do worry that I'm going to uh, get hauled off by the arm and um, be in a lot of pain. So there are a number of things that do make me nervous, but I just try to channel my energy and my thoughts and think about, in this case, the people in Iran and how much they're suffering already from the sanctions and how terrible these last 17 years have been in terms of all the interventions and what it's caused for so many families and people that I know in the region. And, and that gives me a lot of strength and courage. Yeah, I wanna talk about Iran, but first I have one more question about your activism. I, I ask all my guests who are activists, what in your upbringing made you such a fighter for uh, social justice and in your case, peace? I became an activist during the years of the Vietnam War when I was in high school. Um, and uh, it was a particular incident that happened in my family when my sister's boyfriend, who was off fighting in Vietnam, sent her home the ear of a Viet Cong as a souvenir to wear around her neck. And I was so disgusted by that that after throwing up, I decided I was going to work against war. So I think that gave me a lot of resolve at a young age, and I've uh, stuck with not only the anti-war issue, but also more generic uh, social justice issues, because I think even though my family uh, was conservative, uh, many Republicans in the family, I did grow up with a sense of uh, fairness mm -hmm. and uh, always as a young child wanted to or called out things that were unfair. And that certainly was has stuck with me over the years about 
Um, it should not be because somebody is born in a particular home in a particular country uh, that they get a good life uh, and somebody born somewhere else doesn't. So that sense of injustice was ingrained in me. Yeah. Now, um, you've been to Iran many times and you speak very highly of the people. Can you talk briefly about the country of Iran and the people that you've met there? Well, imagine in our new country, it's hard to conceive of a country that's 2,500 years old, that has this amazing ancient history and beautiful architecture and literature and uh, the poetry of centuries ago is used at uh, weddings in the United States today of Rumi and Hafaz. And it's a beautiful culture of tremendous hospitality, of treating guests as if they were a gift from God. Uh, the food is spectacular. And the, um, the movies that come out of Iran are so profound, the music. Uh, so it's a country that has so much and has, and has uh, provided so much to the human civilization over the years and continues to do so. So I think it's a, a, a people that we can learn a lot from. Yeah, now for the people who are watching that don't understand the history of Iran and why the clerics are in control there, can you talk about uh, what our CIA did back in the 50s that caused the blowback that we that that country uh, then faced and faces now. Yes, there's a very direct connection, Lauren, between the Iranian people voting in a prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, in 1951, with a mandate to nationalize Iran's oil because people felt that the benefits of the oil should go to the Iranian people, not the British. At that uh, today, the company is BP. And uh, they, in a very democratic fashion, voted him in and he was carrying out that mandate to the horror of the British company and then the British government who convinced the Americans and particularly the CIA uh, to work with them in a coup to overthrow Mossadegh, which they did successfully in 1953. That brought the Shah back in, in an even more repressive way, uh, all of the dissident organizations were banned, people were arrested, they were killed, they were jailed, tortured. Uh, Iran became the number one purchaser of US weapons and those weapons were used to repress their own people. And there was only one space really where people could go and uh, talk about their grievances and organize and that was the mosques. And so when they were finally able to overthrow the, sh the Shah in 1979, the clerics became the ones with the most organizational skills to take advantage of this new opening. And uh, unlike the secular people who had been fighting against the Shah for many, many years, they were the ones who grabbed control. And it was a revolution then that was not only anti-Shah, but anti-American. And it has evolved over the years, but continued to be a, a government that is uh, very much uh, putting the most important mandate in the hands of a supreme leader, a religious leader, and a um, system that has had an adversarial relationship with the United States ever since. Now, talk about um, the good and the bad of the government. I mean, on the one hand, there there's human rights violations, they're repressive, but on the other hand, Jews are a favored people, uh, women have extraordinary rights. Uh, talk about that dichotomy. Yes, I mean, unlike the um, Saudi regime, which is an absolute monarchy and there's no attempts to even talk about national elections, in the case of Iran, there are elections. Unfortunately, those who can run are vetted by a guardian council. But even with that vetting, there are different factions that vie for power. So it makes a difference if you have somebody like Ahmadinejad, a conservative in power, versus somebody uh, more reformist like Rouhani. Rouhani, for example, was able to successfully negotiate the Iran nuclear deal and put a lot of his reputation into negotiating with the West, which is something that Ahmadinejad did not want to do. Uh, so it does matter who gets elected in Iran and there is a society where women are constantly fighting for more and more rights and where 
Um, there is a mixed bag when it comes to things like freedom of religion. You mentioned Jews were considered uh, a, um, a, a religion that is actually looked highly upon, but there are other religions like the Baha'i that are severely oppressed. So um, it's a government, I think, that continues to have way too much power in the hands of unelected clerics uh, and too much power also in the armed forces, the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, but it is a country that has um, a system of political parties that do vie for power and uh, do have different ideolo ideologies uh, and people do care about who wins. Uh, in fact, they care so much that they went out on the streets in 2009 in what was called the Green Revolution because they felt that an election was stolen from them. Yes, now talk about the Iran deal because in my mind that was one of Obama's uh, finest, if not only, accomplishment. It was yeah. the shining accomplishment in terms of foreign policy issues and perhaps that is one of the reasons why Trump was so against it. It was Trump was also against it because uh, the Israelis and the Saudis, who the Trump administration and his personally his family are very close to, uh, yet on the other hand, there are all these other countries in the world, uh, as well as the UN Security Council that ratified this um, uh, nuclear deal, the whole European Union voted in favor of the nuclear deal. So it was something that the broad global community wanted, uh, except Trump was more anxious to listen to the Saudis and the Iranians than our traditional allies like the Europeans. I think you meant the Saudis and the Israelis. Yes. Yeah. So they negotiated that deal and you were saying that the deal was working. Can you talk about that? Well, it's not me saying the deal was working. It's the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency that, that um, said in 10 different occasions that Iran was complying with the deal. So the, uh, there uh, really uh, was a consensus among those who care about these issues, not from a political standpoint, but from more objectively about what did the deal say and was Iran complying? Um, that, yes, they were complying and it was a good deal and there were compromises on all sides. But the real fatal flaw of this deal was not what Trump says, that it had a sunset clause or that it didn't include things like Iran's missile program or it didn't uh, include uh, Iran, Iran's other activities in the region. The real fatal flaw of the deal was that it was not a treaty because Obama didn't think he could get two thirds of the Senate to ratify it. And that made it so easy for Trump to pull the U.S. out of the deal. Because it was like an executive order or something like right. that. Right. Let's talk a little bit about why Israel hates Iran, because we just said that Jews have a favored status there. Uh, could it be perhaps the Hezbollah thing? Because I asked you this question at your talk. Um, you know, Israel is always trying to say that Iran is the main sponsor of Hezbollah, which is operating in Lebanon to try to overthrow Israel. Can you talk about that? Well, certainly that's one of the reasons. And there is a very close relationship between Iran and Hezbollah. And Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon is seen as very heroic for having beaten the very powerful Israeli army twice and is now considered also a legitimate political party and is part of the government. Uh, but yes, uh, Israel is very unhappy with the tie that Iran has to Hezbollah. And uh, the Israelis, uh, well, let's face it, I mean, when uh, the 1979 Islamic Revolution came to power, it was anti-Shah, anti-US and anti-Israel. And certainly they uh, do have slogans like death to Israel, by which they don't mean the Israeli people, they mean the Israeli government, but certainly it's a very harsh slogan. And uh, the animosity does go both ways. The Iranian government has been sympathetic towards the Palestinians, uh, something that, of course, the Israelis don't like. Uh, and uh, in general, I think the animosity uh, is uh, one that is not a historic one because the Shah was very close to Israel. 
but came as part of this revolution that overturned the traditional relationships of the Shah, and that included the relationship with Israel. And as Israel uh, is so closely tied to the United States, in fact, Israel needs the United States hegemony in the region to continue to exist. And so uh, Iran is part of its anti-US and being anti-US imperialism, uh, it lessens the power of the United States in the region, which Israel sees as something to its detriment. Talk about the um, Hudson Institute and this guy, Brian Hook, who was speaking there. What is Brian Hook's position within the Trump administration and why was the Hudson Institute hosting him? The Hudson Institute, one of these very conservative Washington DC think tanks of which there unfortunately are many and they're very well, well funded if you look at the number of staff at this place uh, and a very prime space in the heart of Washington DC, they have quite a lot of money. And they um, uh, brought in Brian Hook, who is the special envoy, they call it for Iran, I would say special envoy against Iran. He is the uh, person in the State Department who is in charge now of this Iran action group that has been created. And it's supposed to determine US policy towards Iran. Brian Hook and John Bolton, I think, are the people who are uh, uh, making the policy along with Mike Pompeo. And Brian and Brian Hook was there to uh, give a speech about how dangerous Iran is. He must have said the word missile about 60 times in the course of a very short, maybe 20 minute speech. Um, he was positioning Iran as a threat to the United States, which is absolutely ridiculous. He talked about Iran uh, killing Americans and he talked about Iran uh, having missiles that could hit Europe. Uh, he talked about um, uh, Iran as a, uh, the state's largest state sponsor of terror, which is a term that they constantly use. But as I was sitting listening to him, it sounded so much like uh, the lead up to the war in Iraq, where there was a deliberate attempt to demonize a country through lies and distortions and pure uh, inventions. In fact, no mainstream press that I have seen did a fact check afterwards of the things that Brian Hook said, which should have been done because it's very important on so many levels um, to understand how much he um, spewed uh, uh, facts or half truths um, and, and acted as if this were indeed uh, the reality in the region that Iran was responsible for all of the problems in the Middle East. And so um, we will be seeing Donald Trump in the UN and there is another event in which Mike Pompeo and John Bolton are speaking about the problem of Iran together with people from around the uh, Gulf region that don't like Iran from the Emirates and the Saudis and they're going to be together tomorrow uh, at an event and all pointing the finger at Iran as the number one problem in the region. So I think in the next couple of days, we're gonna see a real heating up of the rhetoric against Iran. Right, and I wanna talk, uh, my final question to you is gonna be about how do we stop that? But before I ask that question, I want you to talk about the sanctions because you mentioned the sanctions during your disruption how they only affect the Iranian people. And I've been reading that, you know, the, the big sanctions that are coming up regarding the oil on November 4th, they're already starting because the governments in Europe and the companies in Europe don't want to piss off the United States. So can you talk about those sanctions and the effect that they're having on the currency, on the people, on the economy? As soon as Donald Trump uh, won the election and then afterwards, particularly when he brought John Bolton into his administration, the companies around the world and particularly in Europe that had been negotiating business deals with Iran because when the, the uh, nuclear deal was signed and the sanctions were lifted, many companies went in, 
uh, when they realized that the U.S. was going to turn around its position, they knew that they were going to be subject to strict U.S. sanctions, and they started to pull out of those deals. And this has had a terrible effect on the economy. The value of the currency has plummeted. The prices have doubled. People are having a very hard time getting by. With the many, many thousands of responses that I received after my uh, disruption, I, uh, the saddest ones have been from Iranians saying that they can't get married because they don't have the money they need anymore. Uh, they can't have a child because they don't have the money to raise them. I was in touch with somebody tonight, a very sad case of a wonderful man who had been um, studying for his PhD, but now doesn't even have the, um, the money to take the exams. Uh, and other students who can't continue to live abroad because their parents can't afford anymore to uh, pay for them. So people's lives have been totally disrupted by this. And I've been talking more about middle-class people. Imagine what this has done to the poor in Iran. So people are hurting, and this is by design. The US wants the people to be so miserable that they get out on the streets and they uh, revolt against their government. And this could lead to real chaos inside Iran, just like we were seeing in so many other countries in the Middle East. So it's mean-spirited, it's inhumane, and it really is dangerous for uh, the future of Iran as a united country. Now, is there any opposition forces that the U.S. is funding in the way that they often fund opposition forces in other countries, which oftentimes do not have the best interests of the people at heart either. For many years, the U.S. has been uh, supporting covert activities inside Iran. And in fact, the terrorist attack that happened two days ago in which 26 people were killed at a military parade, uh, the uh, Iranians have blamed it on Saudi, Israel, and the United States. I think there's a lot of collusion between those three countries, and they have been uh, supporting people inside Iran, ethnic minorities encouraging them to rise up, secular groups encouraging them to rise up, and they've been currying favor with the MEK, the uh, People's Mujahideen, which is a terrorist organization that is known for its activities during the very bloody Iran-Iraq war in the 80s, where this group went over to the enemy side, to Saddam Hussein, where they were trained and uh, and weaponized to go back into Iran and blow things up, which they did. So the U.S. has been supporting terrorist groups for a long time. Mm. Okay, so what can people do who are watching this, who are very upset by this, to try to stop this in the tracks? And in a broader uh, context, what do you think we need to do to revive a robust anti-war movement in this country? Well, I would say during the lead up to the Iraq war, there was a very robust movement. In fact, there were millions of people who got out on the streets in the United States and around the world to try to stop that war. And even in the beginning years, there was a very, very strong anti-war movement in this country. It really dissolved when Barack Obama came in. And unfortunately, during the Trump years, because people have been hit with so many other issues from immigration to Supreme Court justices, attack on women's rights, uh, issues about living wages, Black Lives Matter, so many key movements, uh, they have not had the bandwidth to take on the foreign policy issues or the military budget. So you're right, Lauren, we don't have a robust anti-war movement at, at a time when we really need it. I mean, just look at the war in Yemen and how devastating that has been. It's been very hard to get people out with us, for example, in front of the Saudi embassies to protest the Saudi bombing, even of a school bus that just happened in August. Um, what do we need to do? Well, we need to build that movement. In the case of Iran, uh, we need to reach out to those in the Iranian American community, and it's a, a very large diaspora, uh, but a very divided one. Uh, there are many who would like to do anything to overthrow the Iranian government, but there are also many people in the diaspora who understand that at this moment in history, 
um, a violent overthrow of the Iranian government would be worse for the Iranian people. And those are the people that we are making common cause with, the ones who will say no sanctions, no war. Uh, and so we were, are building a very wonderful alliance. We're having a uh, Iran summit in Washington, D.C. on December 1st, where we encourage any of your listeners who are interested to come and join us. We're talking to people in Iran about taking a large delegation of like a thousand people in Iran to show uh, that there is tremendous opposition here in the U.S. Um, if people sign up for our alerts at codepink.org, um, we send out things regularly about what people can do. This week, for example, we're going to encourage people to contact uh, their local newspapers, the L.A. Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and say, don't do what you did in Iraq, which is failure to cover the lies of the administration. We want you to really come out and fact check everything that Donald Trump, John Bolton, uh, Brian Hook uh, say about Iraq, about, about Iran. Um, we're also doing a wonderful social media campaign where uh, you can check it out online. Uh, we encourage people to hold up a sign that says peace with Iran and send a message to people. If they want to try doing it in Farsi, we have a wonderful script for them. And we are starting a, a robust uh, exchange through Instagram and Twitter and Facebook uh, with people inside Iran. So these are some of the things that we are encouraging people to do, and we really need more support and would love any of your viewers who are interested to contact us and get involved. Great. Well, listen, Medea, it's been a wonderful interview as always. You are a total inspiration to me. I've only disrupted about two or three government meetings in my career as an activist. So I have a long way to go to catch up to you, but uh, I, I just have such admiration for you. You're a role model and um, everybody in the country thanks you for your work. Well, thank you, Lauren, for the, the hard work of educating people and having shows like this that give people ways to uh, put their discontent into action. Great. Well, I'm going to uh, give you a preview of my show, which is Wednesday night. I'm going to be interviewing two other activists, a father-daughter team, Desiree Bates Roja and her dad, Al Roja, who are the lead organizers of the Boycott Driscoll's campaign. Some of you may be familiar with Driscoll's. They make blueberries, they make strawberries, but they also treat their workers very poorly. And there's a campaign going on to boycott them. A National Day of Action, I believe, is on Saturday uh, the 29th. So my show is going to be Wednesday night. And you'll learn more about this. And you'll also learn about the farm workers movement, which Al Roja worked side by side with Cesar Chavez. And he actually split off from that group for some very interesting reasons. So tune in to my show on Wednesday night. Share this show, and as always, keep fighting.